Um, a, a big thanks to Michelle and to Linda for all the hard work and inspiration and perseverance that undoubtedly went into to putting on this event. I'm sure you would all agree it's been of great value to each of us, and, um, and we appreciate it. And I'd also like, yes, indeed. It's been a unique opportunity. And I would also like to uh, pass along my appreciation to all of you who are here today. Um, I mean sincerely when I say that it would be very difficult to overstate the importance of what you do, uh, the impact that you're having on lives throughout the state of Iowa. And I want to talk a little bit more about that. My presentation essentially has two components. One, kind of the hard numbers, and the other, essentially the moral arguments, the, at the level of the heart, the things that drive what we do. And um, there was a poem I read many, many years ago that had a deep impact on me, a poem by Oliver Wendell Holmes. And a single line from that poem really captured my imagination. It was, alas for those who never sing, but die with all their music in them. Now to me, that line perfectly captured the tragedy of individuals who have been so damaged, so wounded by the world, perhaps by themselves, that they were unable to fully become what they were intended to be. And like undoubtedly many of you in this room, I was always haunted by such individuals. And it would not be until years later that my career brought me to an arena where I would be able to have a greater impact on the lives of such people around me. Four years ago, I was branch manager for Manpower, staffing and recruiting firm in Ames, Iowa. And that really opened up my eyes to the realities of the workforce. I think we all tend to hang out with people who are like us. So through my life, the people who were within my sphere of influence were similar to me. They were working, they were on a decent career track, and just working along. And, and most of them, like me, had no one within their sphere of influence who was struggling with any barriers to employment. So it's classic out of sight, out of mind. Well, it was no longer out of sight when I began working for Manpower, because we had scores of individuals who came into our office each week to apply for employment. Now, many of those individuals were work ready, and of course, we rolled them out, sent them to work. But many of them were not. And I was always haunted by those, the ones who were struggling with alcohol or drug dependence, uh, the ones who had some level of mental or physical disability, whom I knew that with some modest accommodation could make it on the job. Uh, individuals who had no reliable transportation, no marketable skills. Perhaps they just arose from a circumstance of poverty and they had never really had a work ethic demonstrated to them. And um, I was always um, disappointed when at the conclusion of those interviews we had no choice but to hand those individuals an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and say thank you very much for coming in. Here are some resources that may be of assistance to you. We have no um, opportunities that match with your skills and qualifications at this time. And undoubtedly, many of the items on that list were for your organization. So we were sending them off to workforce development people, off to job developers. But I'd go home and I was haunted by those people. And um, later I transitioned into business development. And here my connections became, rather than uh, business to candidate, they were primarily business to business. And here the irony just blew wide open because I talked to employer after employer who lamented the fact that they were unable to find qualified workers for their businesses. Now we hear so much about the skilled trades. Everybody talks about the skilled trades gap in Iowa. And it's true, it exists. And I think it's more fun to talk about skilled trades because those jobs pay 17, 18, 20, 22 bucks an hour. And uh, so a person could potentially make a life out of that. It's a little less fun to talk about the entry level positions that pay 10, 11, 12, 13 bucks an hour. But in point of fact, Iowa employers are struggling mightily to fill those roles. Uh, the production workers, the assemblers, the material handlers, or in an office setting, contact center employees. Those entry level positions are going unfilled. And um, the net result of that for Iowa employers is uh, we're whistling through the graveyard. Within a few years, unless we make some significant changes, Iowa employers may be looking out on half-empty production floors or half-empty contact centers. Time to get creative. And that's something, obviously, that we all wish to avoid. So at any rate, um, another um, um, <coughs> philosophy that guided my actions is one uh, by Edward Abbey. Sentiment without action is the ruin of the soul. I know that if you feel passionately about something, and you fail to adapt your life around that passion, 
in a way, it's a bit of a lie, and I think a person loses something of their humanity. You know, I read the old history books, and it seems to me sometimes there was an era, there was a time when men and women, uh, deeply moved by passions, would bravely alter their lives around those passions, even to the point of giving their lives up for those passions, and certainly making changes to their lives. But interestingly enough, it seems like in our modern era, people who do that are kind of regarded as weirdos. Uh, crackpots, eccentrics, um, and uh, so I think that more of us have to uh, be willing to, uh, to make those dramatic steps in our lives if we truly want to make an impact and remain honest to what we feel is our calling. Sentiment without action is the ruin of the soul. So um, around that time, as I was puzzling in the evening after work about what might be done to help remedy this problem, I initially had the concept for the Iowa Job Honor Awards. That would have been around August of 2012. And uh, the idea was we needed to make an impact, I knew, on both ends of the equation. Uh, the um, thousands of chronically unemployed and underemployed Iowans who are struggling with barriers to employment. And also, we needed to impact the employer end of the equation. Because as we all know, employers frequently have a built-in institutional disinclination to hire non-traditional candidates. They look at them and they say, looks like trouble, looks like expense, looks like turnover. So I knew that from a marketing perspective, it's imperative for us to reach both ends of that equation. And began um, working as a moonlight initiative with the knowledge of my franchise that I was cranking out this thing and we'll see what happens. So jobhonor.org slowly but surely began taking, taking place in my weekends and evenings. And um, as time went on, um, more and more of the critical stars began to align. Uh, there were a few things that I knew we desperately needed. One, we needed a good venue where people who, um, who could actually make decisions would see these things. Now the idea was we wanted to create videos for the honorees in two different categories. One category for individuals who have overcome significant barriers to employment, and the other category for employers who do a laudable job of hiring such individuals. Again, our desire to hit both ends of that spectrum, impacting both supply and demand. We wanted to capture those stories in three-minute videos and make them as compelling as possible, because I knew instinctively that all the statistics in the world can't win hearts and minds, but personal stories have that power. And indeed, in my own life, it was the personal stories that made the difference. I have to acknowledge, when I first went into this, um, I had the philosophy, I guess what I would call the hard-nosed businessman. You know, I knew theoretically that we had hordes of um, chronically unemployed and underemployed people. And I gotta admit, uh, my knee-jerk reaction to that population could probably be best characterized as con contempt, disdain. My attitude was, hey man, you got a lousy work ethic, you reap what you sow there's jobs out there, get up and work them. And so that kind of persisted in my dismissive uh, approach. The thing that changed was as I began working on the Job Honor Awards and researching, I went to the middle part of the equation where all the job developers and workforce development agencies reside and I began hearing the personal stories. And some of them were heartbreaking. Individuals who um, you know, uh, grew up raised by six or seven, with, with six or seven siblings by a grandparent and uh, not equipped with any of the things that most of us have been equipped with. Showing up at kindergarten not knowing the names of their colors. And I realized, so these are the hands of cards that some of my fellow Iowans are being dealt. How could I uh, be condemning of, of such a kid? Um, it's, it's, it's up to me to be their advocate, uh, not, not their attacker. And so, so in the same way that that's part of my whole history moving in, basically repenting of my hard-heartedness, I knew that by telling the personal stories might impel others to do the same. It's easy to be dismissive of a theoretical person, uh, but a hurting human being standing in front of you, it's a tougher thing to dismiss that individual. So we wanted good three-minute videos to capture it. Also, we needed a great venue, and the audience, in my view, had to be business people. Um, a lot of the celebrations that are currently being done in this arena arise from the human services ranks. And those are fantastic. They um, raise esprit de corps and um, reconnect people with the transcendent purpose of their jobs. But what sometimes they don't do is reach the people who are not already drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, I knew that what we needed to reach was the people who hold the keys to the jobs, the employers. They are the ones that want converting. And so we had a great venue. We uh, began partnering with the Iowa Association of Business and Industry. They have a three-day conference every year, and they pick a different part of the state each year. 
So in our inaugural year, 2014, the conference was to be in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And on the third and final day of the conference, we were in the beautifully restored Paramount Theater. And there was to be around 1,000 business leaders from across the state. Uh, we were helped by the fact that the keynote speaker on that day was to be Mike Rowe from Dirty Jobs fame. So of course, that helped pack the joint. And some of you may or may not know that um, Mike Rowe also has a, um, a side venture. His real shtick is um, he uh, wants to see more and more people um, uh, moving away from the traditional knee-jerk four-year degree, got to have, add to a trillion dollars in student loan debt, and consider instead a, um, an honorable job in the skilled trades, uh, where they can build a great career, go home, and sleep like a stone. And he's, he's made a lot of good headway in that regard. So he was going to speak right after me. And, um, so the very first video we played, I had no idea how this thing was going to go over. I thought, man, if I look out in this audience and uh, they are bored to tears, I'll probably have to slink out of here and pretend that this thing never happened. Uh, but I was pleased to see that the audience reaction exceeded our wildest expectations. There wasn't a dry eye in the house. Uh, we had a sustained standing ovation for each of our four honorees, two individuals, two companies. And um, indeed, everybody in that theater rose to their feet for an extended standing ovation. And I knew then, standing behind those curtains, right thing, right time. And that's a rare thing. I've been involved in startups before, most of which are gently smoking craters. And um, it's a really difficult thing to have the right thing at the right time. So suddenly, I felt that it's incumbent on me to, uh, that I was steward of something that had some real potential to change lives, to change hearts. And it was incumbent on me to not blow it, but to make sure we hoist the sails full and get out of this thing everything that we can. So I'd like to show you the very first video uh, that we showed there at that event. <laughs> I've been a diesel mechanic my whole life. I was actually injured on the job, and through the process, all the surgeries, they, they assured me that I'd never be a mechanic again, and never. And naturally, I was unemployed for a year and a half. That's where I met Linda Hall. And Linda told me, she says, well, Dave, what you need to do is you need to pick yourself back up. You need to find another occupation, and you need to go with it. I can't wrench full time. I can't do my job full time, but I can teach. So we decided that I, I would try to get a small business. And Linda helped me through all those classes to get things situated. So that's what I did. And I never thought it'd grow as big as it is today. I've taken people that have been bricklayers or alcoholics or, or just special needs people that are slow or handicapped. I've, we've had several war veterans come back that don't know anything about trucks. And I'll, I'll have them doing something as simple as ordering parts. Monotonous job, but it gives you great satisfaction. David will take anyone that we call him about. He will work with them. I had one person that was a felon, as well as dual diagnosis with drugs, alcohol, and some mental health issues. And he, no problem, bring him on in, and he worked with him. If you're willing to work, I usually find a job for you to do. I got this job because I was at a vocational rehab. It's a fun place to work, the environment's fun. Co-workers, you can get along with the co-workers, just that, like that. Some of my best employees are the ones with limitations because they strive harder than everybody else. Always. They're always on track to make you happy. They want to make you happy. We've faced just about every kind of special needs person you can have, and they're all different. But if you just go out of your way a little bit to help them, you'll get it back 10 times. Now that's all you gotta do is give them a helping hand. There's a few I've lost money on. Very few, very few. Far, far greater value to, to take somebody and dust them off and give them a second chance than it is to, to blow them off in the beginning. You want people to be treated the same way you want to be treated. You know, I needed a hand up at one point in my life. So wouldn't it just be right to turn around and help somebody else? You know, you give them some self-value, they'll give you back more money in return than you ever invested. Their quality of life goes up, your productivity goes up. You excel together, and that's what it's all about. Just give them a week, and either you'll be amazed with what they can do, or if it's not for you, it's only a week. What's a week? Thank you, and, and, and that was essentially the uh, crowd's response. We were so pleased to see um, a thousand business people on their feet 
uh, getting enthusiastic about the prospect of hiring disadvantaged candidates. And I spoke to a couple of individuals in the audience afterward, Pat Steele and, and also David Mitchell, and, and I think that uh, both um, used um, an adjective that, uh, that st stuck with me, and that adjective was game changer. The idea of seeing that many employers gathered together in a room, truly getting pumped up about the idea of hiring disadvantaged candidates, shows how potentially special this is. And I think that one of the things we need to consider is, um, and one of the differentiators for the Job Honor Awards is um, I'm not afraid to discuss these issues in value-laden terms. Um, I think people tend to glaze over when you talk about statistics like workforce participation rates, et cetera, et cetera. At bottom, what we're dealing with here is human beings and how we're going to treat them. And I think that there's absolutely nothing wrong uh, with um, taking measures to awaken compassion with individuals who have the power to help others, and similarly to awaken hope within individuals who are in danger of succumbing, succumbing to despair. And uh, so we do all that while making a positive business case. And in fact, um, I'm always careful to make sure that we do this mindful of employer needs. Um, I describe us as taking a balanced and business-like approach. America's Job Honor Awards does not advocate for the indiscriminate hiring of red flag candidates. Our premise is simply this. An individual who has overcome their barriers to employment by completing a reputable uh, workforce Development Agency's program represents no greater risk of turnover than a member of the general public, and indeed probably less, owing to the intense scrutiny and training that that individual has undergone. And employers who have hired such individuals tend to report that they get a very high quality employee that tends not to have that sense of entitlement that we see so frequently among the job seeking masses. But a word that uh, permeates the program is gratitude. <laughs> Gratitude, they appreciate it and they hang on to the job and they are reliable. So you'll note um, if you get a chance to look at all of our employer honoree videos, to a person, they are making clear that these are not charity jobs. These are individuals who are coming in, they're making a significant contribution to the organization. They're lifting morale organization wide. And so based on the success of two years uh, events in Iowa, I approached um, our corporate headquarters, Manpower Group in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Manpower Group, um, large company, um, I think we did uh, 24 billion last year, Fortune 129, and um, fired off an email to the company president, not knowing whether I'd hear anything back. And two days later, I got a response. He said, hey, I watched your Iowa videos, was deeply moved, shared it with our executive team. I want you to come out to Milwaukee and discuss whether we can be of assistance in fulfilling your dream of spreading this nationwide. So a few days later, I was um, en route to Milwaukee, met with the executive team for three hours, and the upshot of that is um, we're going national under the um, umbrella of America's Job Honor Awards with Manpower Group as our lead sponsor. And indeed, I've been making a lot of trips back and forth between Wisconsin lately because they are next on the list, the Wisconsin Job Honor Awards launch in um, February of 2016. And surprise, surprise, they have some workforce crises in, in Wisconsin too, so, of all things. Okay. Now the problem is clear to all of us. Iowa employers don't have enough candidates to fill their open positions, and yet simultaneously thousands of Iowans can't find jobs because they have barriers to employment. We must do more to bridge that gap. Now I tend to view things simplistically, so in my mind it's always a little three-part equation. Here we have on the left uh, job seekers struggling with barriers. The barriers are in the middle, the jobs are on the right. And of course barriers are multi-form. Uh, you've all probably dealt with um, many if not all of these. Criminal records, limited English skills, no reliable transportation, <laughs> drug or alcohol abuse, no marketable skills, poor work history, and the like. So the way it should work is this, the three-part equation, again, we have the disadvantaged job seekers on the left, the employers on the right. Now in the middle, we have the workforce development agencies. Um, these can be obviously governmental agencies, Iowa Workforce Development, IBRS, um, and a lot of community-based and faith-based organizations, whether it's Project Iowa, Spectrum Resources, working with ex-offenders, most of whom are doing a terrific job of equipping those disadvantaged candidates with the technical skills and the life skills they need to get and hold a job. And so uh, I have found that this situation, we essentially have two major bottlenecks. One 
insufficient numbers of, of disadvantaged job seekers entering the programs. And I think there we have a case where a lot of people have surrendered to despair. Uh, they've been disappointed too many times in their lives. Too many doors have been slammed shut and they simply opt out of the workforce. They drag their ball and chain and move off into the darkness. Um, and additionally, on the employer end of the equation, we have a lot of employers, obviously, who are reluctant to hire, sometimes for compelling regulatory reasons, although I've got some, some big efforts underway to, um, to work on that and find out if uh, perhaps employers are being unnecessarily restrictive in their hiring, uh, which is uh, very advantageous to insurance companies, uh, but perhaps less advantageous to a struggling person with barriers to employment. But we're going to try to put that under an electron microscope and make sure that employers are given good guidance so that they know precisely what side of what bright line to stay on and, um, and still not run afoul of, any, uh, of hiring any individuals that they shouldn't be hiring. So we need to move more people from left to the right in that equation. One thing that I'm sure we would all agree upon is uh, the workforce development agencies very frequently, um, they're, they're wonderfully proficient at dealing with their target demographic, whether it's ex-offenders, the blind, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, sometimes, however, they are less adept at reaching out to the employer community, and it's asking a lot of an individual to be both things. So um, one of the things that I certainly hope that America's Job Honor Awards will be is essentially an unpaid, outsourced marketing service for the types of work that you do. Um, I've said it uh, from the earliest stages, and I say it now. It's the goal of America's Job Honor Awards not to build roads out of poverty, but rather to illuminate the roads that already exist, to shine a spotlight on your efforts, and in so doing, inspire individuals to avail themselves of your services and inspire employers to hire your clients. So we're gonna to try to move more and more people left to right. The videos that are on the website are your videos. And already we have some organizations in Iowa that are using them. I know um, uh, David Mitchell has shared them with the IBRS offices. Uh, Pat Steele and Central Iowa Works, um, they're using them. Um, if you've got an employer who's a tough nut to crack and want to convince them how helpful this could be, show them a video. Um, if you have a client um, who's um, down on themselves and uh, pretty much given up, show them a story of somebody who overcame similar problems. We eventually want to have a library in which um, multiple barriers to employment are represented, multiple employment situations are represented, so people can see themselves in those videos. We want these to go viral. Again, I already talked about the balanced business-like approach. Often if an employer sees somebody like me coming, they think, okay, um, here comes the, the bleeding heart lunatic who's going to try to foist on me a lot of loser candidates who are just going to create nothing but problems for me. And that's not the case. I, um, I've been a hiring manager for much of my life. To go back to the left side of that equation, I'll be frank, uh, there are many of those that I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole in, a, in an employment environment simply because they have not changed. When I talk to a group of ex-offenders, uh, for example, down at Fort Des Moines, one of the first things I lead off on in talking to them is uh, I have absolutely no desire to teach you to deceive a hiring manager unless and until you have overcome the patterns of failure that landed you in this room then you're just going to go out and blow it and cost everybody a lot of time and money. And I say that not to be cruel, not to be harsh, but the truth will set you free. I say that to let them know that they must change and they can change and that that's the first requisite. But even after that, there's step number two, and that is convince a hiring manager that you have changed. So then my next hour with them is typically spent in how to uh, convince the hiring manager that their lives caught up in uh, misery and uh, despair and brokenness has altered and is now on an entirely new trajectory. And unless and until they can articulate that change, articulate that new trajectory, there's no reason at all to believe that that individual's problems will not repeat in the future. They need to face those facts and they need to fix them. With that, I'm gonna go ahead and show you another quick video if we have time. I wanted to show you at least two. Well, I'll tell you what, before I do that, let me touch upon two very encouraging trends. Now, I know we've talked about in the last two days a lot of trends that are working to our advantage. Uh, first of all, we have the low unemployment rate. And anytime you have a low unemployment rate, that can incline employers to want to be creative and to look into other pools. Another one that I find particularly interesting, however, is the growing consumer emphasis on corporate responsibility. At our current Iowa unemployment rate, which is 3.8%, that means we have around 63,900 unemployed people in Iowa. 
Well, Jack Trice Field, when you fill in the little corners there, seats around 61,000. So you can see that the unemployed in Iowa represent pretty much one packed Jack Trice Field. Seems like a heck of a lot of candidates at first blush, but let's look at it more closely. Uh, let's say you're a company struggling to hire individuals. Well, most of those people live nowhere near your place of business. Moreover, to be blunt, most of the people in that stadium are only nominally employable. They may have issues of social interaction uh, that make them tough to get along with. They may have no reliable transportation. Um, they may just have low emotional intelligence. They always blow it. They get, they're a hothead. Five days in, they get into it, and they're out of job. A lot of people there that are not necessarily employment ready. So the bottom line is this. If that's our only source of candidates moving forward, Iowa's in trouble. But there's another number that we discuss far less frequently, and that is Iowa's labor force participation rate. That is the percentage of people who are either employed or actively seeking employment. In Iowa, it's usually around 70%, which is pretty good for the rest of the nation. Not a lot of daylight between us and all the others. But what does that mean? It means that we currently have unemployed, roughly the size of a Jack Tri Stadium, 63,900. But our untapped workforce in the state of Iowa, working age adults who are neither employed nor actively seeking employment, are in excess of 300,000 Iowans or nearly five full Jack Tri stadiums. Now, who the devil are these people? Uh, well, some of them are rich and they don't have to work. Um, <laughs> some of them have opted to stay home and care for family members. Some have disabilities that are so profound that they cannot work. Um, some are veterans who have had a difficult time acclimating to the civilian workforce. Some are older Iowans encountering age discrimination as they apply. And many of them have prior criminal convictions. And after about 50 doors have been slammed shut, uh, they move off and, um, and give up and check out and probably reoffend. So that's the, um, the, the state of the state in Iowa. And the case that I make is this. If we can engage just one-fourth of Iowa's untapped workforce, we will more than double our supply of available workers. And they can rise up through those entry-level ranks, which is critical because the skilled trades positions traditionally are filled by people who rise up through those entry-level ranks. And um, no one's going to move to Iowa for a $10, 12 or $14 an hour job, except perhaps a refugee who's struggling and will take anything. Um, so what we are is what we are. We're going to have to work with who we have. And the time is now to take a hard look at our, our great untapped workforce. And I think we can demonstrate to the rest of the nation how with compassion and with business savvy, we can tap into Iowa's great untapped workforce. The second thing I'll mention very briefly is, this encourages me, um, increasingly consumers are focusing on corporate social responsibility. There are a number of surveys out there, particularly among millennials, that demonstrate that millennials place a tremendous amount of importance on companies that do the right thing. Now to be honest, my generation was less concerned with that sort of thing. It's all about uh, low cost. And, um, but for all the things about millennials that just drive me to whiskey, this is one thing. <laughs> This is one thing that I really do respect, and I think it bodes well. And in fact, if you look at some of the studies, um, uh, corporate social responsibility influences what to buy or where to shop, 84% of them, where to work, 78%, and in a talent war, kind of significant, isn't it? Which stocks or mutual funds to invest in, which products and services to recommend to people. In other words, it's huge. And companies need to wake up to that, and I think slowly they are. Companies are aware of the fact that um, a smart thing to do is to engage in cause-based marketing. Now, there's always the, uh, the irony that we know that a company legally exists according to their charter for one reason and one reason only, and that is to enrich shareholder value. So if a human being was guided by those same principles, we would call that person a psychopath. Uh, but that is the legal definition of corporations. But increasingly, they are making the judgment call that, you know what, despite the fact that's what we have to be about, um, and if we're going to thrive in the marketplace and develop differentiators, we need to be seen as corporate, corporately responsible. Well, how better uh, to um, reward the companies that do the right thing than to put them on stage at America's Job Honor Awards and say, here's a company that's doing it right, and everybody's on their feet applauding. We hope that that will inspire the other employers in the audience to, uh, to consider going down those same roads. So what we're doing is we're shattering preconceptions. I've once described America's Job Honor Awards as a publicity stunt 
in what I hope is all the best sense of the words. I want to rebrand what it is to hire someone who's had a troubled past. I want it to be cool to do so. And the way to do that is to tell these stories, to raise up new heroes. And indeed, that's what we're all about, is a new kind of hero. I mentioned going through my own life. Um, this is a line from a speech I gave at a commencement address. Forgot to put it in here. But there is real joy and even giddiness that attends the discovery that you've been a complete fool for much of your life. <laughs> and I've gone through phases like that myself, far from dispiriting. Um, man, it, it, knows you, it shows you you're alive. You know, we're all in this together. We're all walking wounded on a broken planet. And I make the case that this shared hardship should bind us together in love. You know, everybody in this room um, has taken some beatings, uh, some more than others, and um, some of the wounds are self-inflicted, and who cares? Um, should it not burn in all of us a desire to help each other and uh, to make sure that each of us can achieve our maximum potential? And so I think that those kinds of sentiments can be stirred up in society, and this is one way to do it. Um, I will throw in, because I, I used to think everybody knew this parable, but man, for, for what you're doing, it's in, imperative that you know it, because it's so easy to get disappointed and think the problem is so enormous and intractable, I can't make a dent in it. But for those who don't know, the parable of the star thrower, old man's walking along the beach with his grandson. As they're walking along, the little boy occasionally reaches down, picks up a starfish that is washed up onto the shore, and tosses it into the waves. And after a while, the old man asks, he says, why are you doing that? And the little boy responds, uh, well, if I don't, they'll dry up and they'll die. So the old man reflects on that, looks up and down the beach, and he sees that it's just littered with tens of thousands of starfish. So he looks at the boy and he says, uh, can't you see there's tens of thousands of these things? What you're doing can't possibly matter. And the little boy looks down at the starfish in his hand and says, it matters to this one. And he tosses it into the waves. So the critical thing for all of us to bear in mind is the inability to do something perfectly is never an excuse to do nothing at all. We all need to be in the arena. Um, I dare you while there is still time to have a magnificent obsession. And my very last story, because I'm a story guy, Robbie Zacharias tells this story, which he heard growing up in his native India. A uh, little boy has a collection of marbles, beautiful marbles, wide variety. His sister has a bag of candy, wonderful candy. Well, they're each eyeballing each other's stuff. The little boy sees his sister's candy and he wants it. The little girl sees her brother's marble, she wants him. So finally, um, he decides, maybe I need to propose a trade. So he approaches his sister and he says, look, I'll give you all of my marbles if you give me all of your candy. And so the little girl deliberates on that seriously. And finally, she comes to him and she says, it's a deal, let's make the trade. So she hands him her bag of candy. The little boy goes to his room to gather up his marbles one final time. And as he's placing his marbles in the bag, uh, he begins to be tempted by the thought, you know, if I was to hold back a couple of my favorites, she would never know. So he surrenders to that temptation. And he begins squirreling a couple of his favorite marbles under the pillow. Puts the rest in the bag, ties the bag up, heads down the hall, gives the bag of marbles to his sister. And of course, she's totally oblivious to his deception. Well, later that night, the little girl lies asleep in her bed, a big peaceful smile on her face as she dreams happily about her wonderful new marble collection. But down the hall, her brother tosses and turns sleeplessly, tortured by the question, I wonder if she gave me all the candy. <laughs> so I submit to you that what you're doing is the right thing. You cannot overgive. In fact, an unsurrendered will um, can never find peace. I truly believe that um, it's only by giving that you will receive, only by serving that you will be elevated, and only by laying down your lives that you will gain it. And uh, to the degree that that's what you're all engaged in, I salute you, I thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.